Hello, everyone. My name is Mario Martinez. I am a tax auditor and work for the tax and licensing department. And um, I've been with the city for a couple of years now. And before that, I was working with the Department of Revenue, Arizona Department of Revenue. And before that, I was I worked for the New Jersey uh, Division of Taxation. So I'm from the East Coast, but I'm loving it here. Uh, and uh, my my job is to um, uh, you know help people uh, understand their the compliance requirements when it comes to um, transaction privilege tax. And uh, that's also known in other states uh, as sales tax. And um, so what a transaction privilege tax is a tax imposed on businesses for, um, for the privilege of doing business in the state of Arizona. And they are taxed under article 42nd of the Arizona revised status. And that article identifies different industries that, um, that are subject to taxation. And, uh, and vacation rentals fall under the uh, transient lodging classification. We at the city of Escazdo charge an additional 5% tax, uh, also known as bed tax on uh, vacation rentals and hotels. Um, so when you, when you combine the city, county, and state tax rates, uh, you, you get a 14.02% uh, tax rate on vacation rentals. And um, so something very important to know is that if you are in the business of short-term rentals, you must be licensed with the Department of Revenue. And um, the Motor City Tax Code is, is specified that uh, the license has to be issued under the owner's name. And I know I want to emphasize this because there's been some confusion sometimes. If you have a business and you have a, pri a, a property management company run your business, and they are reporting, they might be paying everything uh, that you owe or that you're supposed to pay, but if they are not reporting under your license assigned to you, they're not doing it right. Uh, sometimes they just reporting everything under their license uh, or they will give you their license plus three numbers because that's your location, uh, the number that is assigned to your location. So if you have a uh, like a nine, excuse me, like 11 digit number that they told you that's your license number, that's not correct. TPT license are only eight digits. Usually it begins with a 07 or a 20 or 21. So just keep in mind that uh, it's very important. So, so you need to be licensed under your name and that's very important. And, and that's uh, the legal grounds are specified here for the city code is uh, section 310E. Uh, so how do you apply? You can apply simply uh, by visiting www.actaxes.gov. Uh, that is the simplest, fastest, uh, and the best approach. You can um, you, you go down to the business section and click where it says enroll and file and pay online. And we'll have these uh, handouts already outside on your way out, you can grab it. Uh, so if you click there, uh, it will uh, take you to, to a, a place where you can create an account. And um, I have a handout too for a step-by-step -step direction how to do that if you need, if you need, if you need help. But it's really easy when you get that account, you'll be able to file, pay, and pay online. And also uh, you get the license within 48 hours. So it's really simple. Um, if you have any questions, you can uh, also give us a call because sometimes they will ask you things that you might not, you might not be familiar with, but uh, we'll be happy to help you with those things. So that's the easiest way to get license. And the second way is you can, you can do via paper form. Um, so you get a, an application that is called a, joint tax application or also known as JT1. And you can get that, um, that application at ACDOR forward slash forms. You can just type JT1 and you can download it, fill it out and mail it to ADOR. But this process will take uh, two to four weeks. So if you have that form with you and you wanna send it to us via email, we can send it to them to process. And we have an, a special, special unit in ADOR that works with the cities. So we'll be able to send it directly to them and they will issue your license within five to three business days. So that's just, uh, that's, that's, that, uh, you know, that way it will be, it'll be between the online processing and the mailing. But any, anyway, if you don't wanna do that, you can just mail it to ADOR with the, to the address that is in the form and you'll, you'll get your license. But even after you get your license, you might be required to get an account online to pay online if you want faster processing. So. I just recommend you do it on, online at once. 
And so another, another requirement of transaction privilege tax is that you need to be filing your returns. So if you, and let me be clear, like if you have, uh, if you do all your business through VRBO or Airbnb, they are required to pay the taxes, to collect the taxes on your behalf and send them to ADOR. That's all they're required to do. But since you are required to have a license and all of those licensees are required to file, you will need to still file your, file your returns. And there are different uh, frequencies that you can do this. Uh, if you do all your business through one of those third parties, you will be able to file annually. And the due date is January 20th of every year. Um, so if you if you do this way, if you if you do it this way, you can you will still need to tell us how much you made that year. Uh, let's say for the year 2020, you made fifty thousand dollars in your business. When you file your return, you need to tell us you you made fifty thousand dollars, and then you will be able to take a deduction for the same amount if all your business came through a third party that is paying the taxes on your behalf. So you'll take a deduction and I also have a TPT form uh, that I have available outside. You will have to say, I made $50,000, but uh, I'm gonna take out a deduction of $50,000 and you will use a deduction code 775. And that way you, don't, you won't be penalized. You won't, get a, you won't get charged a tax, but you're complying with your filing requirements. So that's very important. If you have a, again, if you have a private uh, uh, property management company and they're filing your return under your license, then you don't have to worry about it, but just make sure that they are doing that. You, you, should, you should get copies of your returns from them. Also very important is that if you're doing business solely through one of those third parties that I mentioned, uh, you should be getting, you should get a form from them. Is a, um, the form is 50, is 5018, 5018. And this is like an exemption certificate It's for your records. Uh, this form, they have to fill it and sign it and they'll give it to you. And, and it's stating that they're responsible for paying the taxes. So if you ever uh, get audited, you have your records uh, and also keep the records of your, that they send you every, every, every period, you know, every month or every year uh, have, of how much you made and how much they pay on your behalf. Um, so that's very important also. Also another requirement is that you need to, you need to list your TPT license number on the advertisements. Like if you're advertising online, uh, that TPT number, they have to be advertised somewhere in that description. Uh, it doesn't specify at the beginning or the end, just make sure that you list the eight digit number uh, for all to see. And um, you know, if you don't do it, uh, there's a penalty for it. It's the first of offense is $250 and subsequent offenses are $1,000. So uh, my, my colleague Deborah is gonna talk about what are we doing as a uh, as unit to, to help taxpayers comply with those requirements. but yeah, we, we are trying to get everyone educated. And if we don't see a, a license being advertised, we might send a, a violation to ADOR for them to find uh, the, those taxpayers. Um, so that's, that's what I have. Uh, but Deborah is going to talk about what the senior requirements are. And after she finishes, we can uh, discuss any, we can address your questions. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah, and I'm a license inspector for the city of Scottsdale. And my job here today is to provide you with the information that the city of Scottsdale needs you to do regarding short-term rentals. Um, first of all, on our website, on our website, we're providing all this information to let people know what they need to do to be in compliance with what guidelines we have set. And also on the state website, it also has the information of what you'll need to be compliant with the state and the city. But what we're asking is for you to go on our website. If you go onto our main website, scottsdaleaz.gov, and you just click on the business link, type in short-term rentals, and it'll tell you how to register online. It's very simple. It just asks you basic questions like, it is gonna ask you for your TPT number that you have with the state. So that is important that you contact the state, go on their website and get that TPT number under your personal name or your business name, however you're advertising that short-term rental. So how do we get the information regarding short-term rentals? We get that information from various methods. The ADOR sends us a list of 
people that have registered and with them that have a TPT license and not compliant with the city. So we do send out letters to people once we find out that they're not licensed with us or registered with us. Actually, it's a registration, not a license. You would register the short-term rental with us. So that's how we reach out by having uh, concerned citizens also report violations when they hear no loud parties. This is all how we find out that they're short-term rentals. So we're trying to reach out and educate everyone on what they should do to become licensed and to be in compliance with whatever the city requires and the state requires. And you can search it on our website and also make sure you have that state TPT number first before you register with us. That's basically all the information that we have for you at this time. Any questions that we can answer? Do we rely on trust to report the short-term rentals or vacation rentals to us? Actually, yes and no. Uh, we do rely on trust, but we also, me as a license inspector, I have to search any kind of method to obtain that information. That may mean going on to uh, vacation rental websites. And if I see your property there, and then I contact that owner to our, her question was, how can her neighborhood track the short-term rentals if they notice there's three of them in their area? Um, the answer is you can, also, you can go on the city of Scottsdale's website. If you type in that address, it will have an I next to that property and it will say that they're registered. And also you can, um, if you know that they're registered, you can also inform us that they're not registered or you suspect a short-term rental in your area and then we follow up from there. The question is, how long does it take for, to bring them into compliance once we notice that they're not in compliance? Normally within 30 days because we send out letters and then we send out a follow-up letter and then still not register, we're gonna send them a violation to the ADOR to get ADOR involved and that normally gets them to respond. Once we send our second letter, normally they respond right away. Uh, yes, the gentleman asked, um, what is the update on the number of registration uh, in the city of Escasso for short-term rental? Yeah, we have a report every, we can check a report every day. Uh, the last time I checked last week, it was 967. But uh, if, and if you can give me a call, I, I'll be happy to provide that uh, exact number. But inc it increased in a month. Uh, they register about 150 in a month or something like that. And the question is, is, is it possible to for a short-term rental owner to be registered with ADOR or with a TPT license and not be uh, registered for city requirements in our website and for kind of requirements uh, with, this, with the county? Yes, it happens. And that's one of the ways that we get their information because we get a report from ADOR with all the license that exists. And then, um, and we can identify it by classification. In this, in this instance, we will search by vacation rental, but they're under the hotel classification for the city purposes. So we have a number that we run the data database by, and we get the list of all the license on the hotels, and then uh, or vacation rentals, and then we go and match that against our city database, see if their properties uh, are registered with us. But uh, for the county, there's nothing we can do. I mean, there's we can just only refer them, tell them to go and register on the county. But for the city, we do check that. And some of the letters that we have sent out are to those taxpayers that we had a license for, but they are not you know, registered with the city of Wisconsin. We have a customer in the, uh, in the audience asking um, his neighbor has not, he's been complaining about a short-term rental since 2013. And this person has just registered in 2021. Um, what I can say to that is prior to this year and 2020, there was not an emphasis like it is now on short-term rentals. Every, not only the city of Scottsdale, but every city is bombarded with short-term rentals. That's why we have um, 
That's why we have come up with the city compliance team to let not only the citizens know, but for businesses or whoever suspects that there's a short-term rental to get us involved. So we can reach out to them and we can send them violations or whatever we need to do to get them in compliance with what city and state has. His question is, can a person track how many times a, a property is being occupied and send that information to us? You would send, the answer is, you would send that information to the state because that's where they're reporting their income. To us, they're just registering the property, but the actual reporting of the taxes goes to the state of Arizona. You're welcome. And just, just, to, just to add to that, we don't wanna, uh, I mean, we, um, we have other mechanisms that we can audit businesses. Uh, if we find out that they've been in business for a long time and the city has lost revenue, we can do an audit on them and then we recuperate that, 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 that those monies. So um, if uh, we don't wanna also turn citizens against each other, if you have um, a complaint or you can put it online uh, anonymously, and when they ask us, we don't, we won't know who it is. So we don't want to create any more, any more. Uh, and also if you call us, we won't be able to give you information for another taxpayer. So the question is uh, what happens when a uh, out of state um, vacation rental owner has a property in Scottsdale and they have um, business uh, for um, customers from the same state and the business owner is claiming that this is, these are just friends. Um, well, we have had some circumstances like that, uh, that we, we have heard, like, no, they're just my friends. So if, unless we can, if, unless we have proof that there's a business going on, uh, I mean, we cannot, uh, I mean, again, we can audit them, right? But it, it, at that point, we have to make an economic decision if our resources are worth uh, auditing every customer. So uh, if we know that they are doing short-term rentals generally um, and they are reporting and we have we see the filings that they are reporting and there's money coming in we uh, we wouldn't necessarily go after them for for those few customers okay i think that's all we have time for at this time thank, thank you, you very much, much. Um, one little update from commander scott he he looked online and he said there's 1054 rentals that are currently registered in Scottsdale. Our next presenter is going to be Dave Lauer from Code Enforcement. Hello, uh, my name's Dave Lauer. I'm a code inspector with the city of Scottsdale. And I'm just gonna briefly go over the uh, requirements and what we can enforce in code enforcement as far as the short-term rentals. Um, first of all, a short-term rental is, is classified as any rental where you have stays of less than 30 days in a transient nation, uh, nature. Basically, um, when they're brought to our attention, a lot of times they're, they're brought to our attention by the police department being called out on a nuisance report, uh, solid waste or any other departments that may come in contact with it. So the, the first thing we would do is uh, verify with our city database, which we maintain to see if the property is registered as a short-term rental. Um, also, if a property is not a short-term rental, but it is a rental, they still have to be registered with uh, Maricopa County, which we enforce as well. So we would check the database um, with the assessor's office for that. Um, basically, once we establish that it is a short-term rental and it's not been registered, at that point, we, we will contact the owner. A lot of times we can get uh, information on the owner through um, past cases that code enforcement had at the property or uh, through utility billing. Um, we would contact the owner if we could, first of all, call them up and say the nature of the complaint. And, and most of the times, uh, since it is legal now in Scottsdale to have them, they're gonna be honest about it. And what we would do is we would send them all the information and the links to where they have to register it. And normally, normally I, I try to do this verbally and by email, and I give them approximately you know, 10 days to 14 days to comply. If at that time I'm not, I'm checking our database, which the city maintains and our administrative uh, staff has, if it's showing that they're still not registered, at that point, we will send out an official notice of violation. 
And that, that'll usually go out and I'll generate usually a 15 day notice. And it'll outline all the instructions which they need to do to get it registered with the city and the county and also the time frame. And then it'll also list the possible penalties and enforcement action that could occur if they refuse to do it. Um, these uh, short-term rentals, uh, they're enforced like as far as code enforcement, like every rental property is in the entire city. We basically enforce any zoning codes and property maintenance codes. Um, usually from my experience of um, dealing with these properties, it's normally not a problem because most of them, it's not gonna be an aesthetic problem with the properties. If they're gonna make a business out of it, they're, they're gonna usually keep it looking nice. But we do, when we go out, we look for the obvious exterior code violations that we can see from the exterior of the property. Uh, a lot of times, uh, solid waste will get a call where the um, residents or the management company is not handling their solid waste or their bulk trash properly. We can assist solid waste on that. Um, however, we, we can only address if they're not bringing their trash in at a timely manner, we can, we can write up a notice can, can over a right-of-way obstruction if it's in the street. Um, a lot of times, solid waste will make us aware of these problems. We'll, we'll talk to the owners, of course. And once again, like I said, with, with the help of the police, solid waste and other departments, uh, hopefully we, we work with the citizens and the residents to make things better. If, if you go to the city website um, and you type under search bar, uh, short-term rentals, it has a very detailed pages of all the guidelines, how to register it, and then you'll see a search box. And if you type the address in of the property that you wanna question, whether it, you, you have suspicion that it is a short-term rental, you could type that address in and a map will come up. And on that map, it'll show that property. If that property does not have a blue circle with an I in it, that means it's not been registered. And at that point, we, you know, we would appreciate if you could bring that to our attention, you could email code enforcement, or you could call us at our um, number, our hotline number, and let the um, persons know who take our complaints and they will send the area inspector out to investigate. Uh, it's very helpful at times if you do give your information on the complaint so the area inspector could call you up if he has any questions or concerns. Um, also, a, um, one of the guidelines for these short-term rentals is that they can only rent out to six adults and their, their dependent children. Now, I, I say that because that's under the zoning code and definitions of a family. Although sometimes that is very difficult to prove if you had to take it to court. Because you'll get a lot of people, they'll say, you know, we have four people on the lease. They'll show us a copy of the lease. And, and then somebody will say, well, there was 15 people over there. Well, we have friends in the area and we invited them over for, for a pool party or something. So right now, the, the way it's written up, the only thing we can do is refer that to the police department to see if they had any nuisance complaint over there because of the noise. But as far as actually moving on to issue a notice or a citation strictly on the more than six adults, it's very difficult unless we have some kind of sworn affidavit where somebody can prove that there was more than six people on the lease. Now, a lot of times on the websites um, that these um, owners put them on, They'll put that, they'll advertise, oh, it can stay 15 people. Well, right away, we call them up and we say, you know, by having that verbiage in your ad, right away, you're casting suspicion on your property because basically you can only have six adults. So normally what they'll do then is they'll, they'll change the verbiage. But if we can get proof like through reviews that people will say, hey, uh, eight of us stayed here that night. It was eight adults and we had a great time and stuff then that would be enough for us to issue a notice of violation on the property if we had that evidence. And then if it did come to a, a position where we would have to cite, we would have to approach the city uh, attorney's office to make sure that they felt comfortable with that alone is enough evidence to actually cite somebody. The, um, the, the database is updated by our administrative staff. So when somebody does register, they have to get a license. They have to provide us with the 
a manager of the property, especially if they're out of state, all the contact information. And then once that's all, all been registered and they, they pass all that, it gets put in our database, which is the database that you can go to online. So basically that way, inspector can, can type that in to see if the property is registered. Um, question from the audience, uh, resident has a neighbor that has a constant party house and at times she observes up to six trash cans placed out, four, I'm sorry, placed out and with the with overflowing trash in the street. Normally, I, I would suggest something like that. You would contact solid waste. I know in, in the past that they can accommodate and have two. I, I would assume then if they have four and you're saying a solid waste is aware of that improves it, then basically the, the only thing that solid waste can um, enforce is to make sure that the, the trash is inside with the lid down and that they're placed out the day, the day, the evening before collection and brought in the evening of collection. Unfortunately for code enforcement, the only thing we can help solid waste, and we do regularly, we can go pay a visit, talk to the people, but as far as a notice, the only way we can generate an official notice by the codes we enforce is that if that container is out past the time that it should be brought in. I know speaking with a lot of property managers, they can't count on their, their housekeeping or their tenants to, to do this correctly. So now a lot of them actually are trying to be good neighbors and they're hiring separate services that strictly take their trash in and out. A uh, question from the audience is wants to know if there's any health regulations regarding swimming pools or spas. Basically, it would, these are considered residential single family properties and they wouldn't fall up anything under the state as far as health. Uh, if something is installed, it, it should have a permit. Like if they install a spa, they would have to get, get an electrical permit, make sure it's approved like that. But as far, yeah, as far as my end in code enforcement, uh, there wouldn't be anything that we could require. Of course, if the spa or the pool is not being maintained, if it's stagnant or, or uh, causing mosquito issues, we can definitely go out to the property and we also notify Maricopa County Vector Control uh, concerning that. I got a question from the, uh, from the virtual is how somebody could um, verify whether a property has a uh, tax number. Um, basically, I would say the first thing to do would be go once again to the uh, web page of Scottsdale, type in that address. If it does come up that it is registered, then it can only be registered if it does have a tax number. A question from the audience wants to know, basically, can, can a um, short-term rental be rent it to different parties on consecutive nights. And from a code perspective, yet, yes, it can. Basically, it would just fall under short-term rental, less than 30 days. And um, we regularly have some that probably rent a few days during the week and then on the weekends to different parties. But there wouldn't be anything that we can regulate that if they're following all, all the other rules. Question from the audience uh, wants to know if there's any health regulations or, or standards that these have to be, uh, the short-term rentals have to be held to, but they, we view them as any other residential properties where basically other, other than aesthetic things and condition of the swimming pool, uh, we do get involved sometimes with exterior lighting issues where a lot of times they'll have spotlights uh, or string lights on the properties. And we do address that under the, the lighting ordinance. And basically they have to, to provide proper shielding uh, of the light fixtures. But as far as any health standards, uh, it would be like uh, any other property in the entire city, we, we would enforce basically, you know, common sense stuff. If there's weed vegetation, where it's rodent infestation, stagnant pools, trash, and things like that. But as far as like a state regulation and anything that at this point, there's nothing, I know what you're saying, like they do in hotels. Question from the virtual audience is, um, are these short term rentals subject to the same lighting standards? and also for accessory structures built on the property as all residential properties in Scottsdale? And the answer to that is yes. Um, as far as the structures, um, what I do recommend, if you see somebody building, um, building a structure, it is really beneficial to us that you contact us as soon as possible. That way we can get out there before the, there's much construction going taking place. And what we'll look at is like every residential property, we'll look to see what the square footage of the structure is. 
If it's under 200 square feet, that's one indication that it does not need a permit unless it has electric or plumbing uh, to it, then it would need a permit. But also besides the um, square footage regulation, each individual zoning district, depending on which zoning district you're in, there is approved setbacks for these structures. Uh, the key to that though is to please, you know, contact us. It makes our job a lot easier because if something's been there, if there's been a structure there that's been there for 20 years and it hasn't been changed and it's presenting no blight, no hazard or anything like that, it's very difficult, especially if we can, we can pull up aerials and records. If we can show that, the, that it's been there 20 years and it was installed maybe without a permit by a previous owner, it's very difficult for us to make that owner tear it down unless it is blighting or dangerous. Um, as far as the lighting issues, uh, I did explain uh, before, yes, uh, we, definitely, we definitely address lighting issues and that's one of the concerns. The light can't impede past the property onto your property, it has to be shielded. Uh, if you do have a floodlight and it isn't shielded, then they have to put it on a motion sensor that it basically it'll go on and then go off in a reasonable amount of time. Ba ba uh, question from the audience is, how do we address RVs being rented out for uh, short-term rentals? They are not allowed. Now, a lot of times when we go out, somebody will, will, will complain about that and we'll go out and they'll, they'll show proof or we'll talk to the people and get documentation that it's a relative visiting. And usually something like that will allow for one month if it's parked legally on the property and there's nothing, no illegal hazards hookups to it. But if they, if we, we did have one where a gentleman was making his school bus into a short-term rental in the driveway. And we did, we did shut that down because basically we, we just look at that under our zoning code where vehicles cannot be used for living purposes unless for a temporary situation like a visitor. And it would have to be on the property because anything over 22 feet cannot even be placed on the street. And that, that's, uh, that's an issue where the police department enforces that. Actually, um, the question was um, about violations issued by code enforcement for the noise public nuisance. And actually, when we do, we do get the police reports, they usually come in every Monday, we get quite a bit of when they're out. But uh, that, at that point, we identify whether the property is registered or not, and I do contact the owner. I call them up and make them aware of it. And I tell them to contact the police department, give them the uh, non-emergency number to find out why the police were there and, and what was issued. Um, but if the property is licensed and doesn't have any zoning or property maintenance violations, the code enforcement would not issue a notice uh, on the public nuisance noise. One, one, basically it is a police matter and two, we can't issue a citation on something that's already been cited. The police department would cite them when they actually get called, when it's actually occurring so that they can be a witness to what has occurred there. Our next presenter is gonna be Commander Coffey and Commander Scott from the Scottsdale Police Department. So good afternoon, my name's Chris Coffey. I'm a commander with the Scottsdale Police Department. My partner today is uh, Commander Scott Smith. Uh, also commander of Scottsdale. So we're gonna hopefully kind of bring everything together uh, about short-term rentals. And so uh, again, we have a little bit of a PowerPoint. The biggest thing that I want everybody to understand uh, when we go through this is that short-term rentals are no different than long-term rentals. So think about that when we go through this program that just because it's a short-term rental, the city and state use it just as a long-term rental. So let's talk about short-term rentals. So a lot of questions are, why are short-term rentals allowed in Scottsdale? How did this get to be? Well, in 2017, Arizona State Legislature enacted Arizona Verizon statute uh, that eliminates the ability for local cities and towns, including Scottsdale, to regulate these types of rentals based solely on classification or use. Consequently, these rentals are allowed um, by state law in Scottsdale. However, Arizona Revised Statute 9500.39 does not preclude the ability of homeowner associations to regulate and restrict these types of uses. 
So a lot of people ask, what can we do? Well, hopefully uh, your HOA is on top of it and they can enact a CCNR uh, about you know, not allowing anything less than 30 days. If not, if you live in a neighborhood that doesn't have an HOA, they amended the CCNRs, which is an excellent thing to do. So in 2017, the city council uh, wanted to figure out how to have everybody live very harmoniously and peacefully. So they enacted um, the nuisance party uh, ordinance. So the city council finds and determines that the control of nuisance parties on private property is necessary when uh, such continued use is determined to be a threat to the peace, health, safety, or general welfare of the public. The response of police officers and other city personnel to nuisance party locations constitutes a drain of personal and personnel and resources, which may leave other uh, areas in the city without minimal levels of police and public safety uh, protections, all of which creates a significant hazard to the safety of the police and other city personnel and to the public general welfare. So again, what I wanna stress is this ordinance is not directed towards short-term rentals only. Everything that we're gonna talk about can be used for long-term rentals as well. So uh, I apologize because uh, everybody in virtual land will be able to hear with my videos, but here, uh, not so much. So basically the example of one is, you know, what should a neighborhood sound like? So this is a cul-de-sac, it's very quiet, very peaceful. Uh, this one is a party. So you can, this neighbor can hear a loud party from their front patio. So again, what should a neighborhood sound like? What's reasonable? So, what is a nuisance party? So when you call up and you say there's a loud party, what is a nuisance party? So under Scottsdale Revised Code 18-122, it's defined as a nuisance party means assembly, an assembly of individuals or persons for social activity or for a special occasion in a manner which constitutes a substantial disturbance to the quiet enjoyment of private or public property. This includes, but not limited to, excessive noise or traffic obstruction of public streets by crowds or vehicles, public drunkenness, and the service of alcohol to minors, fights, disturbance of the peace, and litter. So what's an unlawful gathering? So an unlawful gathering, Scott Silver Vide Code 18-124, is an unlawful gathering means a party or gathering or event where spiritus liquor is served to or is in the possession of or consumed by any minor or where illegal drugs are in the possession of or consumed uh, by any persons, regardless of whether it would otherwise qualify as a nuisance party. So when you call and it's a short-term rental, is this gathering a nuisance party or is there some reasonableness? And again, we, the police, look at everything, the totality. So we look at the time of day, the frequency, the impact of the neighborhood, general criminal activity, and is this a disturbance? What is reasonable? So we look at it as if you had a family that had a pool and they had a cookout on a Saturday you know, at noon and the kids were in the pool, and they're playing and they're yelling and they're screaming, is that reasonable? Is that reasonable to live next door to a family that has that? Okay, that's something that you would have to decide. And we, as the police, we'd be like, well, that's reasonable. Now, you take that and you now have a rave party and it goes from nine in the morning to you know the wee hours of the morning. Well, that's not reasonable. And so we would then come in and start enforcing the nuisance party or unlawful gathering. What I think you were talking about, Ian, was about notice of violations. So when we get there, when you called us and you say, hey, there's, there's a party, it's a nuisance party, it's an unlawful gathering, then we're gonna look at it. So then we're gonna, step one, we're gonna determine if it is uh, a nuisance party, an unlawful gathering, is it reasonable, is it not reasonable? 
we're going to look at the totality. Is there parking issues? Are people parking on the sidewalk? Are they parking the wrong way? Uh, you know, when we walk up a block away from the house, can we hear this party? And then we'll determine again, at that point, we don't really look at, is it a long-term rental or short-term rental? Because again, they're the same to us. We're just looking at the party and what's reasonable and not. So then we're also going to look in our system uh, about how many times we've responded in a given time period to this address. So if we know it's a short-term rental, then we go back and we look at, okay, we've been out here every Friday night for the past six months. So then we kind of know what we're dealing with. Um, where we have to look at is then we contact the responsible party. So that could be the renter or homeowner. So if it's a short-term rental, we're gonna contact the renter. We're gonna explain why we're there. We're gonna explain what a nuisance party is, what an unlawful gathering is. Uh, we're gonna collect all that information to see if they have all the necessary information in their window from tax and licensing. That's where we, tax and licensing and code, work as partners, because then we're gonna give that information to them for follow-up. We're gonna to explain to the renter exactly why we're there, what's acceptable behavior, what's not. Uh, again, we look at it as if it's a family and they're out in the pool and it's you know, 11 and they're having a barbecue, we just explain to them, hey, you're in a short-term rental and this is, you know, this is neighborhood, this is why we're called. We're gonna give them a warning. If it's a party, again, we may give them a warning at first because again, we have to treat everybody the same. We just can't come in because we've been out here last Friday and automatically issue somebody a citation. So we give them a warning. We document that because again, all that documentation goes to the homeowner as well, if it's a short-term rental. If we come back a second time, then we would issue a notice of violation. Um, so I'll go. So if we issue a notice of violation to the responsible party, that's an automatic $500 fine to that person. So those fines are not run through the court system, but they're through tax and licensing. But they, all, they do have a 10-day period where they can um, basically uh, try to, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, fight it. And so there's a hearing officer. Uh, our officers would show up. We'd have on-body camera. We'd have you know, all the information then to prove our case. So the next time that we would go out there, if this was the same night, then that responsible party could be arrested for disorderly conduct. So they could be arrested, booked, and then released. Again, they can be charged with all other criminal activity. So if we find that there's minors being served alcohol, that's another charge. Uh, littering, um, fighting, other things, other criminal activity, they can be cited for that. What happens with the homeowner? Well, the homeowner uh, gets one warning. So if we come out there and we see that there's a party, the homeowner is going to get a warning. We go out there a second time, they will also get a violation. So the first violation is uh, $1,250. So again, they get a violation because what we're hoping that they will come into compliance, they will rent, if it's a short-term rental, they will do a better job of renting to uh, not party goers. If they get a third violation, that fine jumps up to 2,500. The state has come in and stated that we cannot, the city cannot uh, find them any more than $2,500. So even on the fourth violation, the fifth violation, the sixth violation, the 20th violation, they're still at 2,500. So that's how that system works. So it is somewhat frustrating because if you have a homeowner and they, they can, pay the fine and they keep doing what they're doing. It's where code, tax and licensing and police, we try to work together and try to bring them into being a good neighbor. So um, the reason again, so then Saturday comes 
and the people from Friday, they leave. They're gone now. Saturday comes in. We start it all over again with them. We get a call. We come out. We determine if it's a nuisance party, an unlawful gathering. We give them a warning. And then we come back a second time. We will give them a notice of violation, which is a $500 fine. Third time, again, they might get another violation or they could be subject to arrest, depending on the activity that we see. So again, a lot of people will ask us, well, we want you to come in because it's a short-term rental and automatically give them a $500 fine. So again, that's not reasonable because again, it's like if I showed up at a long-term rental and just knocked on the door and said, you're being loud, here's $500, you know, fine. They'd be like, whoa, wait, where's the warning? You know, we got a little at hand with like some warning. So that's how the notice violation works. As tax and licensing talked about, and also code, uh, where to go for information. So on our, the city's website, you can go to Scottsdale EZ, you can type in short-term rentals. Then you can go down to uh, short-term rentals, and then there's a couple blocks that come up. This is the one that you wanna look at, vacation rentals and short-term rentals. Then it'll give you all the information. What is a vacation rental? What's a short-term rental? Um, great resource. All the facts that you need to know. Um, where does this tax go? Uh, how do I know if a property in my neighborhood is used as a vacation or short-term rental? Another great resource is uh, the Maricopa County Assessor's Office. This is a great resource as well. Uh, go in there and that will also help you see if uh, a property is uh, registered with, with the state. Um, again, if you have any questions, I'm sure we're gonna answer some, but these are some great numbers. Non-emergency number for us, 312-5000. Uh, Code enforcement, 312-2546 and tax and licensing 312-2400. I did wanna to touch before, cause I'm sure it's a question and I'll jump in there right now and answer it. When we see, because our crime prevention officers, as well as our Intel unit does look through all the short-term rental advertisement sites. If we find one that says great for, you know, bachelor parties and sleeps 18, then we will contact code. Code then contacts the homeowner and says, you can't advertise that. That is a violation. If we get there and you say, uh, I know that there's more than six people staying here, what can be done? So it's a little gray at that point, because again, it's what at 11 o'clock at night, you know, where, where there, the state really hasn't put a time frame in there, of what staying means. Overnight, what does overnight mean? And so then we have somebody that says, well, yeah, only six people were supposed to be here, but my friend passed that on the couch. Or, you know, we're not allowed, the police are not allowed to go in to a residence and start basically doing a bed check. We would need a search warrant for that. So what that means is, is that we would have to contact a judge and say, here's our probable cause. We need to go into this, cross the threshold, and we need to start counting people. Well, a judge isn't gonna give us that. If that's all we have, that's, that's not gonna happen. So as Code talked about is yes, if we look on the reviews and they're like, hey, bachelor party, my 20 friends had a great time, we stayed the night, great. We're gonna ship that to Code and look at it. So um, that, that one is, is a very interesting and frustrating one for us as well. So, um, Understand that, that, that this is a partnership, and I say it's a partnership with tax licensing uh, code, us, but it's also a partnership with you as well. This is our community, and we wanna make sure that it's, it's great for everybody, that everybody lives peacefully, enjoys what Scottsdale has to offer. That's why people come here. That's why we have so many short-term rentals. So we do understand that. So again, we will, do the best we can. If there is a naked person out there for a bachelorette party, then we're going to talk to the renters and say, you need to bring this inside because you are in a residential area. There are children here. However, 
there you can be held to other charges because if you have a child that's in the backyard enjoying their pool and all of a sudden now up on a stage of your short-term rental or long-term rental you have a exotic dancer well that's that's against the law. And so that person can be arrested. So we look at the totality of the situation and all charges. And so again, we, it's a partnership with, with you and us to try to do the best we can with the tools that we have available to us. So, so the question was, is that uh, there was a uh, party in the neighborhood with a live band. The live band played from, it was advertised. Uh, which is a violation uh, through code. Uh, the band played from about five to nine. So, and why wasn't it shut down? So it's not shut down in itself because it's a live band, because again, think about long-term rentals or even property owners. If you own your home and you're having, you know, a get together and you have a DJ or a band, and again, it's reasonable um, was the noise reasonable? Was the music reasonable? Uh, five to nine, that's a reasonable time. And so now granted, uh, code, I think there it's after 10 o'clock after 10 o'clock, then that becomes unreasonable. And that, that is a violation. Again, when the police are called, we look at, you know, again, what type of music's being played the, you know, is there vul vulgarity is, and that's something that we would talk to, the homeowners, the renters about, but just because it's a live band um, wouldn't, wouldn't automatically just be shut down. If it's advertised and we can show the police get there and we can show that they're actually um, accepting money to come in to listen to the band, well, that's a violation because now you need a business permit to then do that. So we could then uh, document that and then send that as a violation. So they would need to pay tax on that. Um, but then again, it's, we have to look at is, you know, again, we cite them. Do we, do we shut it down? You know, what, what is it? Is it a wedding? Is it reasonable? You know, think about if you're a homeowner and you spent some money to have a wedding and we come in and we just shut you down because it's a DJ. So again, it's, it's what's reasonable at that time. So the question is, is that the fee, the notice of violation fee to the homeowner, the 2,500 is not a substantial um, deterrent. What is there? Um, great question. Um, and that's something that uh, the short-term rental task force uh, talked about is how to get owners uh, into the fold to be good neighbors. And what is the incentive and what is that magic thing that's going to have a, a, a homeowner or, or company then to be good homeowners? Um, and we're open to all suggestions. So um, I, I, don't have the, I don't have the magic answer for that. We, we are trying to figure that out. And it's, it's information. It's partnership with the community and the neighborhoods. Um, it's having those open uh, communication with the homeowners of, uh, again, a lot of times early on into this, when I first got into short-term rentals is um, educating the, the property owners. Uh, there are times when you do have a property owner, uh, short-term rental that would rent to a couple. And then we call them and say, okay, we're, we're at your house and there's, there's a rave party. And they're like, well, I didn't rent to, I rented to a couple. They were out here for a weekend. I had no idea. So again, then it was working with that homeowner to, homeowner to install uh, more cameras. Again, not, you know, cameras in uh, the pool area, common areas, uh, noise meters in the backyard, uh, having somebody that was available within uh, and. 30 minutes to an hour to come to the property to be a responsible party. So it's a lot of this uh, communication and education with owners uh, to how to be better uh, business owners and property owners. So the question was, is that if a community in their CCNRs had a, uh, a line in there that they weren't supposed to run any businesses uh, out of their home, then yes, that would be a violation through the HOA or the CCNRs. And so 
where that would come from is then the uh, HOA uh, or property management company then would impose the fine on that uh, homeowner. Now, again, if they're running a business, whatever business it is, uh, then that again would go back to tax and licensing and code because they're running, uh, they're running without a business license. So, but that's really more of like a, an HOA violation. So the question uh, from class was that you, you live in an HOA and you have a CCNR and it states that you can have, you cannot have a rent a renter shorter than 30 days. So uh, now if it's, if you can't have it less than 30 days, then uh, that really takes away the short-term rentals. Cause if your minimum is 30 days, then yes, if they're renting for less than that, then that is a violation of, of your HOA. So, so the question is, is that your CCNRs also state that you can't run a private business out of your home. And so then that again would be an HOA violation. So if you knew that somebody was running a uh, business, you know, out of their home, uh, then that's when you would contact the HOA and you would state, hey, here's my evidence, here's the advertisement, they're running you know, a business, a home business, whatever that business is, and then the HOA would then fine them for that. And then again, it's then you would, I would call uh, tax and licensing to see if they were, you know, if they had a business license. And so if they didn't, then that would be a violation. So, but really that's through the HOA. Am I, am I answering that correctly? So the question again was, was and, and if I, if I'm correct, then yes, if your HO, from my understanding, if your CCNRs, if your HOA has in there that you cannot rent your residence for less than 30 days, um, and that you can't operate a business out of your home, and that you're doing that, then yes, those are two different, those are two violations of your HOA. So that's how HOAs and neighborhoods uh, combat short-term rentals within their neighborhood. And so, um, but they're two separate things. So if you had somebody that, that was renting for a weekend, then that is a clear violation of your HOA and your CCNRs because it has to be 30 days or less. Now, if they rent 30 days and then they rent to somebody new for 30 days and then they rent, then that's not a violation because it's a minimum of 30 days. So that's how that homeowner could work around it. So what I would what I would recommend because I'm not I'm not an attorney. So I would I would call your I would call your property management company, the CCNRs, and I would run that through them because that's that's kind of that's beyond that's beyond my scope. So I I I, I can't I don't want to comment on that. Yes, ma'am. So the question is is that when the police arrive at a party or uh, a, a call for service and they talk to the responsible party or uh, guests, they ask them to go inside and they do. And then we leave and they come back outside. Uh, can we tell them to go back inside and then, or do they have to call the non-emergency number once again? So yes, if we, if the police get called for a call for service and, and they're out front and they're causing a disturbance, uh, maybe they're just talking. Uh, it doesn't rise to the level of, of, you know, an arrestable or citation offense. And we tell them, please go inside. Uh, if we give them a lawful order, we're giving you a lawful order to go back inside and they, and they go inside and then they come back outside. Again, we have to be very clear what that lawful order states. You have to go back inside till the morning. You have to go back inside till you know, a time. If we generally say, hey, you need to go back inside because you're causing a disturbance here, go back inside and they do, and then they come back out, you know, now, now we're, and we come back out, uh, we have to look at what was the lawful order? What was the direction? What did they understand? So my question in a vague way is, yes, if they come back out and they're causing another disturbance, please call the non-emergency number. Say, hey, I know the police just left. They're back out it again. They're causing another disturbance. That's when we would come out and then we would deal that, with that accordingly, whether that is a citation uh, failure to obey, um, or just disorderly conduct. When we talked about disorderly conduct, this is, this is a very point that I want to make is that uh, most times we need a 
we need somebody that's going to be a victim. So if you call up and say, hey, next door, you know, they're disturbing my peace, there's a party, uh, but I want to remain anonymous, I don't want to do anything about it, that kind of ties our hand a little bit, because we can come out and we can do something, but we don't have a victim of a crime. So we can try to tell them to go back inside, um, they go back inside, but again, if you say, yes, I want to be a victim, uh, I'm up at three in the morning, I, I will assist, I'm going to go to court because I'm a victim, that gives us uh, more tools to do our job, more probable cause to do our job. So that's important. So the question is, is what can the city do if the owner uh, advertises for 30 days but rents shorter? So again, it, would, it really wouldn't be uh, a city, it, it would go back to the HOA. If, they're, if they live in an HOA and that violates the HOA policy, then that would be that. Again, um, uh, if they don't live in an HOA and there's no requirement through the CCNRs, then there's, there's not a lot the city can do with that as long as they are uh, registered with the city uh, and they have their, their TPT number. So. so the question from class was, uh, when will the state recognize that short-term rentals are very different than long-term rentals and that they need to be treated differently. Uh, that's a state. Uh, so my suggestion is that's where, again, you reach out to uh, at the state level. Um, and I know that there's probably entities out there that are trying to do that because you brought up some very, very interesting points uh, with swimming pools and spas and things of that nature. But, but that's at a state level. And so again, the state has come back to all the cities and said, you have to treat short-term rentals exactly like long-term and you cannot uh, have any different uh, penalties. And so that's, again, that's really a, a state decision. So the question is, is that if you had a uh, company, uh, an LLC that uh, bought a uh, residence for the sole purpose of making it a short-term rental, is that a violation? Uh, and if it is, then who would regulate that? Um, so my, my, it, it's not a violation that I know of. Um, it's kind of what's happening right now across the nation with home prices. You do have uh, platforms, you have residential company platforms that are just buying up properties uh, left and right, and they will either sell them or they might make them, you know, long-term rentals or short-term rentals. Uh, but there is no, uh, that I know of any regulation for that. Now, what that, uh, for us in the short-term rental, as Councilwoman said, is that, again, they would have to have a business license to have a short-term rental or a long-term rental. But what we've asked them is to have somebody uh, available, emergency contact available within an hour to come to the house. Uh, again, we need to know even if it's not uh, a party or an unlawful gathering, if there was a flooding issue or something, you know, that we needed to have a, you know, a responsible party, they, they would have to, to provide that. So hope that answers your question. Thank you to Code and Tax and Licensing, Councilwoman Milhaven and, and the PD for taking time to uh, address you. And it's our pleasure. Again, uh, what I said before is this is a partnership and it takes all of us uh, working together in collaboration to make sure that uh, we have a very uh, happy Scottsdale. It's profitable and, and uh, friendly to everybody. And uh, that's, that's our, our goal and our mission. So thank you to, to the comment.